Yeah, I'll react to that, sure. Okay. That was great. Um, all right, we're doing Zulu. Original link to the video, top of the description. Below that, link to the Discord. Click on it, send you right over there. Also, the Minecraft server info is over there. I just started a few weeks ago, and I'm quite good. Just don't wreck my stuff. If you are not ready to learn, listen. Phone's away. My phone's over there. Throw it. If you are not ready to learn, there's the door. Homek is down the hall. Make me a salad. Oh, I gotta turn off the Minecraft noise. Let's do it. Welcome to a new series of Extra History. Before we start, I've got two announcements. Thanks to all of you who supported us on Patreon, Extra History is now officially a weekly show. New episodes will come out every Saturday from here on, and to help- Yeah, this is, a, this is seven years ago. Help us do that, we've got a new team member. Allow me to introduce Heather McNabb. She and David will be trading off every series. I'm excited. Let's get started. For the next few weeks, we'll be covering the Zulu Empire. Its rise, its fall, and its famous fight against the British. We'll see a small tribe become an empire. We'll see European factions playing out the game of power on South African shores. And we'll see a late post-Napoleonic army, well-drilled and equipped with modern rifles, be beaten by an indigenous population wielding nothing more than spears and hide shields. But before we can do so, we need to talk about sword- Did they just, like, ditch the, the hide shields after a while? The Zulu army? Because, I mean, what good is a shield again, or a hide shield especially? against a bullet horses there's a lot about this period that we just don't know before we can do so we need to talk about sources there's a lot about this period that we just don't know it's not like this in goku jidai where it's simply hard to find the translations of the more obscure records in this case we're dealing with a culture no that didn't records. keep written records yeah. so all we have to go on are scant accounts from european traders and oral histories collected decades after the fact much of what we're going to tell you, especially about the early period we're covering, are best guesses by the historians and archaeologists who have worked tirelessly to piece together the- It seems... For the, the areas that didn't have a, a system of writing, or... It just... What would have... What would have kept them from developing a writing system? Uh, would they have not a need? It's, it's really difficult. It seems like such a basic thing to do, but this is with hindsight, and I obvious look, um, but I, I just, what, what made it so that they didn't need to develop a system of writing? That, that's just, it's so uh, crazy. I the puzzle of exactly what transformed the Zulus, a tribe perhaps as small as 1,500 people living in an area of probably around 10 square miles, into an empire of 250,000 people, ruling over an area roughly the size of New Jersey. So, with that caveat, let's start laying out the background. Be Who much were bigger the Zulu people when this all began? What did life look like for them? How did they subsist? What was their government, their economy, their military? Well, they were a relatively minor tribe within the larger Bantu people, who occupied a region in what would now be the eastern part of South Africa. They had a largely pastoral economy, with wealth being measured in cattle, and the population mostly subsisting on maize and milk. They operated under a kingship, but they had very little in the way of what we would consider centralized governance. Isn't maize a, um, New World crop? And uh, war? Obviously, it's many centuries after uh, the discovery, so... Kingship, but they had very little in the way of what we would consider centralized governance. And war? Well, when our story begins, somewhere in the end of the 18th century, warfare in this region was more of a ritual affair than a destructive endeavor. Warriors would meet at a predetermined location and fling spears and insults at one another, but would rarely move in for close quarters fighting. This left the casualties very light, and it was almost unheard of for the winning side to follow up a victory by chasing down their opponents or sacking or conquering their land. Instead, battles would result in the transfer of a small amount of territory, or some cattle. But Shaka, who will be the central figure in the early part of our story, changed all this. 
He changed the weapons, the tactics, and perhaps most importantly, the philosophy of war in the region. He brought in close quarters combat, replacing the traditional long throwing spear with a shorter thrusting spear that was devastating when used in a melee. He developed a system of envelopment tactics known as the bullhorn formation, which I'll explain in more detail later. And he changed war from a means of settling minor disputes to an activity of slaughter and conquest. I'm seriously having a hard time getting over the, uh... Obviously, I knew that there were many civilizations without writing systems, but the more I think about it, I'm like, how? How did it not just crop up by just people, like, messing around and drawing stuff? I'm just, it really blows my mind how, how they did not have a system of writing. So who was Shaka? Shaka was the eldest son of the leader of the Zulu people, but he was considered illegitimate, and so wasn't named the heir to the Zulu kingdom. In fact, his name, Shaka, means intestinal beetle, which was sort of the cover story for his mother's untimely pregnancy. This becomes kind of hilarious when you realize that we in the West often call him Shaka Zulu, and since the word Zulu actually means heaven in the Zulu language, we're basically calling him intestinal beetle heaven. So, huh. enjoy that. Anyway, at the age of seven, because of his illegitimacy, Shaka was sent to live with his mother among the Ilangani, a neighboring tribe. From there, he moved on to the Matetwa, the most powerful tribe in the region, where he served as a warrior first for a man named Job, and then for Job's successor, a man named Dingiswayo. Dingiswayo took notice of Shaka's unusual prowess as a close combat fighter, and when he discovered that Shaka was actually of royal blood, put him in charge of an Ibuto, which you can basically think of as a regiment and it's here that Shaka really began to refine his tactics. The traditional Ibuto were armed with long throwing spears, and while they practiced the use of their weapons, they didn't do much in terms of practicing unit tactics. Generally, they would show up to the battlefield as more of a loose mob than a cohesive fighting unit. But Shaka began to experiment with this. He armed his men with the short stabbing spear, and drilled them in a tactic that he called the bullhorn. He'd split his men into three groups, the chest, the horns, and the loins. The chest would charge the enemy and pin them in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Then the two branches of the horns, positioned to either side of the chest, would flank and envelop the pinned enemy. This whole time, the loins would sit behind the lines, acting as a rested reserve to be applied where needed. Interestingly, it's been said that Shaka would have these men sit with their backs to the fighting so they wouldn't become panicked or charge over eagerly before he needed them. The brilliance Smart. of this system was that it was simple. Without much battlefield coordination, every man knew what he was supposed to do. If you're in the chest, you charge. If you're in the horns, you get around their flank. The system's simplicity meant that it could be applied in chaotic conditions without much of the signaling that was required by modern armies. So I wonder if the loins was separated into two loins, like a chest loin and a horn loin, so that like you like they're more specialized, like when a when you need more chest people. You send in the chest loins and vice versa for the horns. With these deadly new weapons and tactics, Shaka became a force to be reckoned with. And when his father died, he decided it was time to take his own. Shaka's half-brother, the legitimate heir, took the Zulu throne. So with the help of... For, for a second, I thought he meant, like, take his own life. In just while, Shaka quickly had him assassinated and took the Zulu throne, decided it was time to take his own. Shaka's half-brother, the legitimate heir, took the Zulu throne, but with the help of Dingus Wayo, Shaka quickly had him assassinated, and simply moved in to take over the place. Ah. Dingus Wayo was still the chief of the Zulus, so Shaka continued to serve him, but only a year later, Dingus Wayo was killed by a man named Zwide, the ruler of the Ndwandwe, one of the most powerful- Severed heads, the, uh, what do I The receipts of the ancient world. How do I know you? Well, here's his head. ...powerful tribes in the region. Shaka vowed vengeance for his leader's death, and stepped in to fill the void Dingiswayo had left behind, bringing the Matetwa, and with them many of the other local tribes, under his control. Shaka's vengeance, and the war he was about to bring, would lead to a period of unparalleled chaos and devastation. In Zulu, they call it the Mefikane. In English, we simply call it the Crushing. But before we delve into the crushing, we should talk about why war here became genocide, and why the region was so primed to explode at the first signs of strife. A lot of it has to do with European influence. Not because Europeans tried to cause it, in fact, there were many Europeans who tried to help, but given how radically different, how wealthy, how technologically separated the Europeans were from the local population, their mere presence dramatically destabilized the region. As European trade increased, new crops were introduced, which led to a population increase, which in turn led to greater competition for land. 
Meanwhile, European ships would trade for cattle to resupply their food stores, which made cattle even more valuable and led to an increase in raiding. At the same time, European traders... Meanwhile, European ships... How, what would you pay for the cattle? Gold, like, was gold a... A, um... What's it called? Um, a liquid asset? Or a... A very tradable thing in the... In the... Would trade for cattle to resupply their food store. Because if... So when two, like, societies meet who don't have a mutually understood currency, all that you're going to be able to trade them for is stuff that, that you will notice they could have an actual, so guns, you know, anyone's, whatever, whoever you trade with around the world, they're always going to be, want to, to be fighting with someone else, and we'll see new weapons as a good thing, but... In terms of, like, gold or something, I I'm not saying that... Uh, uh, ...which made cattle even more valuable and led to an increase in raiding. At the same time, European traders also came looking for ivory, and to get ivory, you have to take down elephants, which requires a large degree of coordination from a group of people, which some have said led to the more coordinated and gun. far more deadly tactics that Shaka was able to implement. That's cool. So fighting elephants led to a better that's pretty badass bad arse crap youtube i'm sorry to add to all of this a drought caused the more water hungry european crops to fail which led to a famine so the area natal was already primed for disaster i can't believe that's this i feel like new jersey would be way smaller than it join us next week as we explore shaka's quest for vengeance next 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 preemptive like original link to the Last we left off, Shaka's boss, Dingus Wayo, had just been killed at the hands of a man named Zuide. Shaka had declared vengeance against Zuide and his clan, the Undwandwe, and the Zulu had moved from being a tribe to a fledgling empire. As Shaka consolidated Those control, birds are Zulu badass. had moved from being a tribe to a fledgling Those are the coolest birds. I forget what they're called. Fledgling empire. As Shaka consolidated control over the Matetwa, Dingus Wayo's powerful clan. Today, we look into the war between Shaka and Zuide, and the disaster that followed in its wake. As Shaka took control of the Matetwa tribe, he began to spread his ideas amongst them, teaching them how to fight in Zulu fashion, and having them take on the Zulu name. He instilled in this newly consolidated Zulu clan a warrior culture that had never existed before, and changed them from being pastoral herdsmen to conquerors. With this, Shaka began his frequently brutal expansion outward, bringing in neighboring tribes with diplomacy when possible, but often resorting to the extremities of force. Unlike the ritual warfare of old, when his forces would engage an enemy band, their goal was to destroy the enemy completely. And when the forces under arms were destroyed, he would march into the enemy village, often killing all the men of fighting age, assimilating only the women and children into the Zulu tribe. I, 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 I smirked there, and I probably looked like a psycho, just because I was thinking of like, so, so they didn't, they didn't, um, like, do the whole, they, they would fight and skirmish a bit and then retreat and get a little bit of land in return or some cattle. But then, like, they learned what the, either the European or the elephant strategy of total annihilation of just, hey, why don't we just go in and kill everyone or assimilate everyone? I, I must, okay, sorry. Finally, after training his people and expanding his reach, Shaka felt ready to take on Zuide. As Zuide's Ndwandwe forces pushed their way into what was now Zulu territory, Shaka ran a number of delaying tactics along the Umfalozi River while he moved his people and his cattle out of harm's way. Then he arrayed his forces, about 5,000 strong, on a hill, right in the path of the oncoming Ndwandwe army. To the Ndwandwe, this looked like an easy victory. They had more than twice as many men as Shaka could muster, and never before had one of the Zulu armies really been able to stand against them. Shaka, seeing his disadvantage in numbers, split a small contingent from his force, and used it to lure off a sizable portion of the enemy's army. But the Ndwandwe coming toward the hill still outnumbered him. This actually turned into an advantage for Shaka, though. The Ndwandwe forces got in each other's way as they tried to clamber up the hill in a disorganized mob. This disorder, combined with the uphill ascent, made the long throwing spears the Ndwandwe carried useless. 
the Zulu countercharged, rushing downhill and crashing into the enemy line with their short stabbing spears. The enemy routed, stampeding back down the hill. Shaka gathered his men back into formation at the top of the hill and waited. Five times that day the Ndwandwe charged the hill, and five times they were repulsed by the smaller force. As the day wore on, the Ndwandwe began to suffer from that great bane of armies in tropical climes, the heat. Ndwandwe men oh, started to slip off to the river about a mile away. Meanwhile, every time the Ndwandwe fell back, the Zulu warriors refreshed themselves with supplies Shaka had hidden atop the hill. The day was going well for Shaka, but even with his successes, his force was still outnumbered. Then, Shaka saw a signal fire in the distance. The diversionary force he had used to lure away a column of the Ndwandwe were letting him know that the contingent chasing them were on their way back. Shaka didn't have much time. He needed to shatter the Ndwandwe before the rest of their forces returned. But even though Zwide's men had been beaten back time and again, they had taken a toll on the Zulu's numbers. Seeing this, Zwide marshaled his troops and prepared to lead them personally in one last grand assault. But Shaka was ready for him. All day, this entire time, he had only been fighting with two-thirds of his men, the chest and horns of his bull's horn strategy. The, the other third, the loins, had been hidden in a depression behind the hill, rested and fresh. Now he called on them to join the horns and envelop the enemy. Seeing this large force appear as if from nowhere, the Ndwandwe began to panic. Pinned by the chest and encircled by the horns, this last column of Ndwandwe was crushed, with its tattered remnants fleeing down the hill. Shaka sent a small contingent of men to kill any Ndwandwe they could find taking water at the river, while his main force pursued the bulk of the fleeing army. But as the Ndwandwe column that had followed his diversionary force began to close in, Shaka was forced to give up the chase. The day was a bloody one. As was common in this new style of war, neither side took prisoners. As the sun set, nearly 2,000 Zulus lay dead, as did 7,500 Ndwandwe troops. Jeez. But their leader, Zwide, was not among them. Zwide was not well liked among the nearby tribes, and as cracks in the mighty Ndwandwe army began to show, Shaka was able Friends. Mom. That's it. Among the nearby tribes, and as cracks in the mighty Ndwandwe army began to show, Shaka was able to gain new allies and new client states for his confederacy, bolstering his numbers. After 18 more months of minor skirmishes, the final battle between the two forces came at the Mahlatuzi River. As the Ndwandwe forces were trying to cross, the Zulu engaged, trapping half their forces on each side. Over the course of two days of running battle, the Ndwandwe forces were scattered. Seeing his opportunity, Shaka took his forces and marched on the Ndwandwe capital before word of their army's defeat could reach them. As he approached, before his men were close enough to be seen clearly from the capital, he had them start to sing Ndwandwe victory songs. Upon hearing the singing, the populace rushed out to greet them, only to be slaughtered by the oncoming forces. Zwide managed to escape, but his mother did not. Shaka locked her in a house with jackals and hyenas to eat her alive, and when the night was done, he had the house burnt to the ground so only ash would remain. Over the coming Jeez. years, Shaka continued to expand his reach and assert Zulu dominance over all the tribes in the area. He turned his confederacy into a true empire, and exerted influence far beyond even the regions he could control. But all those tribes he had pushed out, all the fleeing refugees he had left behind, all the warriors he had driven from their homes, spread out like a fire across the savannah. All those men who had seen the Zulu fight adopted the Zulu way of war, and as they fled the now mighty Zulu, they inflicted the same brutality on those around them. This was the Mefakane, the crushing. These tribes that fled the Zulu either died out or formed kingdoms of their own with the same bloody tactics they had learned from the Jeez, so it was like a domino effect of, of being beaten by the Zulus, and then you, you taking that and going to the next people and beating them, which is going to make them do the same to the next. The Zulu, and would... at an incredible price. Over the next 15 years, well over a million people would die as these refugees from the Zulu cut their way across the southern half of Africa. But by 1827, not all was right in the Zulu kingdom. Shaka's mother, the parent who had raised him, died, and he went mad with grief. Sources report him ordering that no grain be planted for a year, that any woman who got pregnant was to be executed along with her husband, that milk was not to be gathered from their cattle. It's said that he had 7,000 people killed for not grieving enough, that he Okay, I don't like this guy anymore. <laughs> ...had cows slaughtered so that their calves would know what it was like to lose a mother. It goes without saying that shortly after this, he was assassinated by his brothers. They'd been trying to... 
good. It's just cheese. To get rid of him for some time anyway. But as so often happens with these things, his two brothers shortly became one brother, as there's just not enough room for two on the throne. And so, with two brothers bumped off in short succession, a man named Dingane became the... That is just the worst thing you can do. Like, imagine thinking so much of yourself that when your mother dies, not even by someone else, you have to implant that on everyone else? Jeez. Leader of the Zulu Empire. After either bribing or killing anybody still loyal to Shaka, Dingane faced a new threat. Dutch settlers, pushed east by the British colonial efforts in South Africa, began to enter Zulu land. At first, relations appeared cordial, with the Dutch help- At first, always- all okay. ...helping to recover some 7,000 cattle from Dingane's enemies in return for land in the Zulu territory. But when the Dutch came to Dingane's capital to sign the agreement, in the midst of a ceremonial dance, Dingane shouted to have them seized and dragged off to a nearby hill, where they were all clubbed to death. Dingane then sent troops off to massacre the now undefended Dutch wagon train. As is so often the case, none of this ends well for anybody. The Dutch sent out another wagon train, but this one full of nothing but fighters. In what's now known as the Battle of Bloody River, over 10,000 Zulus attacked the circled wagons of the Dutch, but with only their short spears to fight with and on poor terrain, funneled into a killing plain. 3,000 Zulus lay dead by the end of the day, and only three of the Dutch were even wounded. This battle broke the back of Dingane's forces. The last remaining half-brother of Dingane, who had fled with thousands of his followers after seeing how Dingane treated the rest of his relatives, now came storming back, and the Dutch immediately became his allies. In the end, he crushed Dingane, and he himself took over the leadership of the Zulu. He established a wary peace with the Dutch settlers, granting them land in return for their aid, and began... I said 2,000 dead. Um... That's crazy. Even though you have a technological advantage over your enemy, that is still pretty impressive. Like, no one died? Either really impressive on one part or really not a great attack strategy on the other, but even... Or maybe the... the I don't know enough about 18th, 19th century gun formations and how many it would take to defeat a, a less equipped army like the Zulus. But that, that seems crazy numbers to me. His reign in relative tranquility. Next week, we'll find out just how that piece turned out and follow the lengthy reign of the new Zulu king. M that was a roller coaster. Pande. Mapande? Piece turned out and follow the lengthy reign of the new Zulu king. Mapande. Interesting video. I know, um,. Especially considering the, the lack of written sources, which is crazy to me. I, I, um, that like n not once did, did a form of writing at least not solidify itself. Uh, it's really crazy when, once you think about it. Cool though. Um, I'll finish this series for sure. And I want to watch a clip from, uh, Zulu. I have seen the movie, but, um, yeah. See you guys next time, all right? I uh, hope you can answer some of my questions. Hope you're doing well. If not, chin up. You'll be good soon. Don't worry. See you guys. Bye.